Good morning, Smoky Point Community Church. My name is Dan Teeter. I'm one of the elders here at the church, and it is a real privilege to worship with you today online. Now, I'd rather be with you in person, and I'm sure most of you would rather be together too. Uh, I really enjoyed getting to see many of you last week uh, in the church in the field services. Well, at least from here up, I got to see many of you. Uh, if you missed out, there's another service in the field coming up one week from today. So next Sunday, there's going to be another service in the field. Uh, those services are 9 a.m. and 10, 15 a.m. And uh, we do need you to bring your own chairs and practice social distancing. It is a family service as well. So it's great to see all families and little ones running around out there. Uh, it is required to wear masks, at least from five years old on up. We expect you to wear masks and, and uh just be together. It's going to be great to see you guys again. Um, so register for one of those two, 9 o'clock or 10.15, and we need to make sure that you go to the, the service that you sign up for so that we keep appropriate numbers. If you can't make the in-person version, uh, then you can still go to our YouTube page, SPCC Messages, which is what you're on right now if you're listening to this. And that uh, service next week will be broadcast starting at 11 o'clock. So in-person, 9 o'clock, 10, 15, or you can catch it later on YouTube. So now before that, less than a week away, this coming Friday, uh, we have another really exciting event coming up. Uh, earlier in the summer or late spring, uh, Alan put together a campfire where we praise and worship together. And we're going to do that again on, on YouTube. Again, SPCC messages. And at 7 o'clock this Friday night, uh, we encourage you to get together with your family and uh, maybe go out and get a dessert or make your own dessert, maybe make s'mores um, and enjoy a good time singing together. We also want to celebrate that together by sharing on social media. So if you go on Facebook or Twitter uh, and use the hashtag SPCC Campfire, we'd love to just enjoy each other's pictures. And uh, you know what? Maybe there's going to be an appearance from uh, Music Man and Bucket Boy one more time. So this Friday night, 7 o'clock, let's worship together. You could know your thoughts, you could grasp your ways, you could match your goodness or deny your grace. You will break my soul, captivate my heart, oh God.
next song uh, is called Be Enthroned. It's a new one. And the the idea of this is that that God is is worthy of all the praise that we could ever give. I I say that a lot whenever I'm leading because it's true. Whenever we we praise, he's he's worthy of what we give him and and so much more. Um, And this song is uh, a line of it is be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations. And what we're singing here right now is just this Sunday, but there's also everybody else that's singing out on today. There's everybody that has sung out yesterday and thousands of years before us, and that'll continue to happen much longer past us as well. And this idea is that the song is saying, be enthroned upon the praises of a thousand generations. You're worthy of it all, Lord.
God, you are worthy of it all. You're worthy of all the praise that we can give, Lord. We are so, so thankful that the words that we sing are sung all across the world, Lord, before us, after us. Lord, we love being a part of that chorus, worshiping your name and giving you praise. Lord, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So let's talk about making comparisons. Now, whether you're consciously aware of it or not, all of us negotiate most of the situations that we live with in life through a process of making comparisons. Take something as unconscious as walking down a trail. You may not be thinking of it, but your brain, your mind, is making comparisons of the terrain that's in front of you to determine which place your foot could go as opposed to a different place that might cause you to stumble. Now, there are a lot of much more conscious forms of, of making comparisons that we do, and one of those would be shopping. I don't know how you choose a watermelon, whether you're a visual inspector or a thumper, but you go to the produce department at the grocery store and you want to select the ripest watermelon you can find. You might be the person who gives it a good look and compares it to another watermelon to determine which one you think is best. Or you might be the person who does a, a comparing of sounds where you're thumping on the watermelon with your knuckles to see how it sounds, whether it sounds hollow compared to the other watermelon. But however you do it, you're comparing one to another to, to make a choice. This whole mental process of making comparisons is really a, a gift that God has given us in order to navigate through life. It, with wisdom, with the ability to choose one thing or another, in a in a bigger purchase, you might you might compare the features of one item and the pricing of that item, and compare that to another item, and look at those features in order to make a wise purchase, whatever you were purchasing. There's also ways that we can make comparisons in in our jobs, in in our relationships with people. And some of those comparisons are pretty neutral when it comes to moral implications, but others are not. There, there are ways that God actually calls us to make comparisons that can result in spiritual fruitfulness and blessing in our lives, and other ways that we can choose to make comparisons that can lead to, to spiritual damage and, and destruction. Take, for instance, the, the way that we arrive at our own sense of value or worth. Now, I can do that, as I'm sure others of you struggle with, by comparing myself with others. And there are really two sides to that coin. If, if I arrive at who I am as a person based on a comparison with other people, I could determine that, that I was more valuable than somebody else because I I view my attributes and abilities as greater than somebody else. Now, most of us probably wouldn't want to talk about that out loud, but we do it nonetheless. On the other side of that coin, I'm sure most of us have struggled with feelings of insecurity because we look at somebody and we see attributes, looks, abilities that they have that we feel we don't have. And, and so we end up feeling lesser than because of that form of comparison that we make. God calls us to make a different kind of comparison when it comes to arriving at who we are as people. As his children, God calls us to compare how we view ourselves to what he says about us. He calls us to compare how we feel about ourselves to how he feels about us. And if we'll do that, we'll arrive at a place of spiritual encouragement and blessing and fruitfulness as opposed to arriving at a place of damage. Now there are, are, are a number of other um, situations in life that we walk through that we have to make these kinds of spiritually significant comparisons that either result in spiritual damage or revolt, result in spiritual fruitfulness. And one of the most important situations that we're called by God to make right comparisons is in the situation of going through times of trial, times of great difficulty. 
And that's what we're going to examine today. We're in this series through the book of Psalms this summer. And I love how God speaks to the very things that you and I struggle with. Because the people that God inspired to write these, these words for us are people just like you and me. They, they faced discouragement and they faced temptation and they struggled through the right and wrong kinds of comparisons just like you and I do. And Asaph wrote Psalm 73 at a time of great difficulty and trial in his own life. And he faced a crossroads of comparisons. One, one type of comparison would lead to spiritual damage and even failure spiritually, and the other led to a sense of spiritual blessing. One type of comparison would lead him to a place of feeling alienated from God and, and spiritually disillusioned. And the kind of comparison that God called him to make would lead to a sense of God's close presence, a sense of hopefulness, a sense of strength from God. So I want us to dive in to this today because I feel like you and I are facing these kind of comparison choices right now in this difficult season that we're in as individuals and as a church. And hopefully as we walk through this psalm and we look at these two kinds of comparisons that we can make, God can help us to navigate the difficulties that we're facing now and in the future in a way that draws us close to him rather than brings us to a place of spiritual ruin or disillusionment. So let's just dive into Psalm 73. And Asaph begins this psalm with a bold statement about what he, what he knows to be true about God. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Now, Asaph starts with something he knows is a fact, that God is good, but not just that God is good in some general character trait way, but that God is actively good, doing good to his own people, because he says God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. So Asaph starts out by saying, I know that God is good, that he's doing good to me, as one of his people. But then in the very next breath, he says this, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. Here he's describing this place of spiritual disillusionment. In a nutshell, he says, I almost came to a place of giving up my faith, of, of coming to a place of spiritual shipwreck. And why? Because he made the wrong kind of comparison in the midst of a time of great difficulty. And he lays that out for us in the next verse when he says, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That word envy means that as he looked at the life of the wicked, he saw something that they had which he felt he did not have. And he felt lesser than. He felt like he wanted what the wicked had. And he goes on in the next several verses to describe exactly what it was that he compared in the life of the, the wicked that led to this, this precipice of spiritual destruction. Let's keep reading in the, in the next verse. In verse 4, he says, For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. Now, I should probably just pause there because you probably don't look at people who are fat and sleek in our culture and think of somebody who was blessed and prosperous. But in that day, when Asaph wrote this, you knew that somebody who was fat was not having any problem finding enough food. In fact, they had as much food as they wanted. Well, somebody that you saw who was thin was likely somebody who was having a hard time getting a meal every day. So their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. So he looks at their life, and physically, it's easy. They're, they're healthy. They don't even struggle with aches and pains until the moment of their death. But it goes beyond that. He says, therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. 
Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their heart overflows with follies. They scoff and they speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. So not only are these wicked people healthy, they're arrogant. These aren't just people that Asaph sees who don't know about God. They actually scoff at God. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heavens. He goes on in in verse 11 to say, and they say, how can God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. So here's a group of people that Asaph is is looking at. He's, He's comparing his life to theirs. They not only don't know God, they despise God. They openly flaunt their wicked acts. And they're healthy and wealthy, and their life is easy. And Asaph's is not. And he is envious of what they have. Now, if Asaph had a pretty comfortable life, he wouldn't be struggling with this comparison. But as he continues to describe his own life, we're going to see what it is that was behind his disillusionment. In verse 13, he says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. Asaph compares the circumstances of his own life to the circumstances of the wicked. He he compares what he's going through right now to what he sees them going through right now. And his life is, is, it's a mess. It's really hard. He feels stricken all the time. And because of the opening statement that he made, he comes to a place where he begins to struggle with his perspective of God. You see, you and I, when we fall into the wrong kinds of comparisons in times of trouble, we can have a warped perspective of who God is. And we know Asaph began to struggle with that because he says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean. He thinks about his life of following after God, of of doing the things that God had asked him to do, of trying to be a, a godly man a man who loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in light of the circumstances that he's in right now, and compared to the circumstances of those who hate God, he wonders if God is really good. Because when he says, in vain, what he's really saying is, I don't know if following God is really worth it. Because if you end up here, if the result of doing the things that God wants you to do is a life of difficulty, and if doing the things that God doesn't want you to do ends up in a life of ease, then what is the point of following God? It almost brings him to a place of giving up the faith, understandably. But we know from the beginning that he said he almost slipped, that he came close to stumbling. And so we know that he didn't. And it was by God's grace that he was able to begin to make a different kind of comparison. He's at this place and he's beginning to wonder if it's worth following God. And in that moment, He says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. In other words, I don't see the point. Life does not make sense. This life of following God makes no sense with this perspective. 
viewing my circumstances and comparing them to the circumstances of the wicked, there, there's no way I can make sense of this, Asaph says. And then God helps him look beyond the present day circumstances to gain a different kind of comparison. Because in the next breath, after saying it was a wearisome task, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You, you make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you arouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. He looks far enough ahead with God's help to see eter eternity, to see the end of life. And he knows that at the end, even though their life may seem like a piece of cake now, that there'll come a day when, just as in a dream, you wake up and it's over. And there's a ter terrible judgment awaiting. When Asaph was in this place, this place of difficulty, because he was making this present circumstance comparison, he wasn't sensing God's presence. He wasn't sensing God's strength, God's closeness, God's goodness. And we know that because he describes that for us in the next couple of verses. When he says, like a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you, oh, I just read that. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. And what he means there is, I'm just like an animal in my response to you. In other words, I'm not responding to you as a son. There, there isn't this intimate fellowship of knowledge and understanding and communication. There's just this dull, brutish response. By God's grace, because he looks beyond today, he gains a different perspective. He says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Because Asaph looks beyond the present day circumstances that he finds himself in. And, and he chooses to compare his circumstances not to the circumstance of, a, of others, but to heaven. God brings him an awareness of his presence with him now. He realizes that, that God is there, that God is holding his right hand, that God is guiding him. And he looks forward to his inheritance in heaven when he knows that, that his reward will be the very presence of God with him. And he says, my flesh and my heart may fail. In other words, Asaph's circumstances, they're not changing. He's not saying, and now everything's better. What he's saying is, even if things completely fail here physically, you're the strength of my heart, God. Because now he has a different perspective. Now, there's a lot of people who, who would view looking towards heaven in a time of difficulty as just a, an escape mechanism, kind of a Pollyannish way of, of avoiding reality. But all through his word, God calls his people to live their life now with a heavenly perspective. To live their life now in view of the fact that they're going to be home with Him. It influences every choice we make. It influences our perspective on our circumstances and our perspective on God. And so let me ask you a question. How do you navigate the difficult places in your life? What comparisons are you making in order to get through those difficult times, in order to find a, a, a means of, of comfort, a, a place of strength? 
Because there are other ways that we can, we can compare our difficult circumstances to bring ourselves some sort of strength, hope, so to speak. How many of us have, have gone through a difficult time and, and looked around and said, boy, I know this is hard, but look at them. I'm sure glad I'm not in their situation. And that can bring a sense of comfort because our situation isn't as bad as somebody else. We can be going through a difficult week and we can compare this week to a week that's to come and we can say, man, this is really tough right now, but, but in two weeks I'm going to be on vacation. And that can bring us a sense of peace and comfort. But the problem with those kinds of comparisons is that there's no God in those. And while they can bring us a sense of relief and comfort, what God wants for us is in the place of our deepest trials. When we look around and we can't see anybody who is going through something more difficult than we're going. When we don't see anything in the future that brings us a sense of anticipation or hope, that we can still have a place where even though our strength God is the strength of our heart. Where even though nothing makes sense in the here and now, God is with us. That we have an awareness of Him holding our hand and, and guiding us towards our eternal home with Him. And, and church, we're going through a difficult period. We have been as a church. We, we have been as individuals. And some of us more intensely than others. But it doesn't look like it's going to end soon. And as we navigate these coming days and weeks and months together, my prayer is that we would ask God to help us get through those difficult times by making an eternal comparison rather than a present day one. That each day we would begin our day as we assess how we feel about the day in light of eternity. Because if we don't, will lose sight of God and his nearness. I love the way that Asaph finishes this psalm. He says, but for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. But even in the deepest trial, Asaph was able to come to a a, a sense of God's nearness. And though nothing else seemed good in his life, God's nearness was his good. And he was able to get through because he made the right kind of comparison. I hope that you and I will do the same thing in the coming months. Because whether we're in a trial now or whether we're going to be in a trial in the future, we need God's nearness. And we need a perspective that reminds us that there's more to this life than just the present day circumstances. It's crucial. And so let's look beyond and let's remember the good promises that God has made each of us as his children. I love you, church. I hope you have a great week. in my heart to break me apart I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life all I am I serve
us through the dark and cleanse every part of me. All I am, I surrender. Give me faith to trust what you say. That you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside. I give you my life. So I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God, you never will. Yes, I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God, you never will. Oh. So give me faith to trust what you say. Your good, your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. My soul is purchased 
With His blood, my life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ, my Savior and my God. With Christ, my Savior and my a good morning so far hearing Tim talk about the word of God being able to worship together it's always a good refreshment for the week and as a continuation of worship uh, feel free to give tithe to any one of these three options up here Um, again that's just a continuation of giving of ourselves Um, just like worship is more than singing songs it's it's a continual sacrifice of our lives and pursuing after him on a daily basis Hope you guys have a great rest of your week. It was good seeing you here today. Hopefully see you at Church in the Field next week. Have a great Sunday.